to a well-designed business. My name is Luann Nigara, and I'm so glad you found this podcast. Together with my husband, Vince, and our partner, Bill, we have grown our company, Window Works, from the ground up. So I know and I understand the challenges you face in running your interior design business. I also know that your talent alone isn't enough to ensure your success. So on this podcast, we talk about strategies and practical steps to help you grow your business. But make no mistake about it, we have our share of fun here too, mixed in with those aha moments that I love so much. This isn't fluff. Nobody has time for that. Whether you are a new interior designer or a seasoned designer, I am here to help you create and to manage the kind of interior design firm that you dream of. It's straight talk and it's action. Are you ready? Let's get started. Hi, welcome to A Well-Designed Business. If there's one thing that we've learned over the last year is that the unexpected happens. Global pandemics, family needs, illnesses, emergencies, these things come our way, whether we like it or not. And when they do, we have to be prepared to adjust our goals and keep going. My guest today, Andrea Highsmith, had big goals for 2020, including opening a brick-and-mortar studio space. What we'll learn today is that she is a goal-driven person, the kind of person who relies on structure and planning to help make sure she's making her vision a reality. But when the pandemic happened, she had to adjust her goals. Today, she's sharing with us how she uses flexibility and structure together to plan for the future and pivot when necessary, no matter what the world sends her way. She's also sharing insight into how she creates ideal experiences for her clients so that the referral train is constantly bringing new work her way. Before I tell you more about Andrea, let's take a moment to thank our show sponsor, Kravit Inc. And to invite you to the virtual Seattle Design Center Spring Design Week next week, May 3rd to 7th. Please be sure to attend Design Discussions with Barry Lance, hosted by Kravit Inc. on May 4th at 10 a.m. Pacific Time, 1 o'clock p.m. Eastern Time. This is an exclusive behind-the-scenes look at Barry Lance's collective debut collection, Canvas to Cloth. I'll be asking Barry about his newest collection and how he brought it to life. Visit the link in our show notes or the link in my Instagram bio to register. So, Andrea is the founder of Ash Interiors and Design and is an interiors specialist, kitchen and bath designer, manufacturer representative, speaker, and presenter. She's been sharing her knowledge of luxury design and products in the design industry for more than 20 years. She recently opened her design studio and office space in historic Ellicott City, becoming the first woman of color to open a brick and mortar design space in this area. I had such a great time talking with Andrea, and I think you're really going to enjoy this episode and Andrea. Hi, Andrea. Thanks so much for joining me on A Well-Designed Business today. Hi. How are you, Luann? I'm so excited to be here. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I'm excited to have you on the show, too, because you were recommended by, by my good friend, Andrew Joseph. And Andrew is your PR rep. Um, how, tell us, how long have you been working with Andrew? You know, it feels like forever because he's just that guy. You know, he has that personality where you feel like you've known him for like a lifetime. But it's only been since the pandemic. So um, I would say maybe June, July. And uh, it feels like, you know, we're like besties. So he's wonderful. Oh, that's awesome. And what a challenge for a PR rep to take on a new client in the beginning of a pandemic, right? Exactly. And, you know, that's the thing that, you know, about him where he just knows how to connect with you and, and talk to you about how do you, you know, make it through this crazy time. And, and it's definitely been wonderful. I love him. Oh, that's awesome. Um, I, well, it doesn't surprise me your review of Andrew. I've known him for many years now, and I agree. Great guy, great firm. So so today, you guys, you and your rep over there at Andrew's firm have decided that, you know, we could talk about surviving and thriving and needing to be flexible when we run into um, a challenge or a pitfall, something that we hadn't expected, whether it be a pandemic or something else. And I'm curious. We, I think we all believe that we have a certain amount of resilience in us. Of course, some are better than others. But I wonder, do you, because you guys suggested this topic, my brain went to, 
oh, is this just an, an organic observation of hindsight of how you have pivoted and refocused during different challenges? Or do you actually have a structured approach to when you need to recognize that something isn't right in the business life, whatever it may be, and make a change? You know, it's a little bit of both. Um, it's funny because even though I'm a creative and artist, I definitely have like this structured side to how I think. So that's actually a part of every aspect of my life, whether it's professional or personal. So I, you know, I think about when 2020 was, you know, about to approach, I had already started prepping, you know, in 2019 saying, okay, what are my goals for next year? What do I want to do? I had this, I had an idea. I wanted to start uh, to open a brick and mortar studio. I had a client number I was trying to reach. I had all these goals. And usually that can feel very, very grand and just overwhelming to some people. But I literally like will write it down. I'm like, I put it on paper and I'm like, okay, how do I do this? You know, and then I break it down into quarters. I'm like, okay, Q1, Q2, Q3, Q4, you know, and then I break it down by months and then I break it down by weeks. But of course, you know, you have situations like this and I have friends that are like, I know you create this plan, but then life happens like a pandemic. And then, you know, you have to throw it all out the window anyway. And that might be the case. But for me, at least when I have this structure, even if I have to adjust it, it gives me a guide. So, you know, my goal for 2020 was to open up the studio. My plan was to open the studio in January and I couldn't find a space and I kept looking. And then the next thing you know, the pandemic hit in March. I didn't stop my idea of wanting the studio. I just said, okay, it may not happen in Q1 like I planned, but I'm still going to proceed in this direction. I'm just going to, you know, adjust and maybe it's a smaller space, but I, I just kind of had to keep that goal in mind. Okay. So what you're explaining to me is that by having the, you know, real look with yourself in the beginning of the year, or it could be today. You could do it in the middle of the year, mm -hmm. right? Um, exactly. You, right? exactly. Like we don't have to wait till next January to do this, right? So, nope. you, know, so no. you, you just sit down and decide, what do I really want? And then you break it into chunks and you figure, what do I have to do in the first three months in order to get this? And in order to get that in three months, what do I have to do in the first month, the first week? Is that how you do it? Absolutely. And you're exactly right. Like it, you don't have to wait until January. You don't have to do it like a new year's resolution, but you know, the first of the month, um, I usually sit down with my designers and I say, okay, what, you know, what is, what are our goals for this month? And they're based on this kind of big picture goal. And then I say, okay, what do we need to do to reach this goal? And sometimes, you know, you give different scenarios. It's like, okay, we could have one large client, we could have three small clients, you know? So it's just that, it's that flexibility with structure, if that makes any sense at all. <laughs> yeah, no, it does. It does. <laughs> it does. So walk me through something. You mentioned that some, you, you mentioned um, a couple of goals for 2020. Your original goals were to have the brick and mortar store and a, a specific number of clients. So we, I, I do want to talk about the brick and mortar store, but let's let's pick that apart. So you sit there and you say in 2020, how many specific clients were you um, intending for 2020? So in my head, I said 12 really good clients. And that doesn't seem like a lot, but we do um, – our, our focus is definitely construction. So whether it's additions, renovations, you know, I try to think about what my client, like kind of what my contractor workload is. And so I wanted like 12 construction projects. We have filler projects throughout, but I want it to have, you know, 12 nice construction projects. So that's, you know, one a month. That's not, you know, but I think about it in, okay, I don't generally count January because it's after the holidays. I don't like counting August because it's DC and everything shuts down in DC. And then usually December because I personally don't want to work in December. So then I say, okay, I have nine months to have 12 clients. And 
and, and I love this. I love the reality of it, right? Because if right. you really, first of all, the reality of January is so true. <laughs> like, like, how many, right? right? And then, <laughs> you know, and, and the others make great sense too. So now that you look at yourself and you say, okay, we need 12 good construction projects. We have nine months to execute them. We're gonna, they're gonna be done. We have nine months that we probably can more likely attract and get them. What's the steps now into doing that? Like, how do you, what's the, cause that's what everybody's thinking. Oh, great, I, I wish for that too. But what do you do in the right. process? Right, so first I am so thankful and so excited because we are hugely referral based, which is good and bad because you know, sometimes you get referrals that you may not want, mm. um, but it's, you know, making sure that we put ourselves out there. And I do a lot of networking and a lot of professional kind of talks and with different organizations. So I, you know, I constantly am, as I say, selling. So whenever I talk to people, you know, whether it's Starbucks or, you know, I don't know, the mall, it's like, oh, this is what I do. This is what my company is. Here's our card. We we focus on construction, interiors, et cetera. I also reach out to my existing client base. Um, I have some fantastic loyal clients. My longest standing client is literally 18 years. Mm. We, we've gone through multiple houses, multiple rooms. So there's always different things going on. Um, so, you know, what I tell my team is, you know, just always tell people what you do and ask for what you want. I learned that actually from a woman who does um, business development and networking and, and things like that. And she said, she always says to people when she meets them, you know, what could I do for you to help you grow professionally? That's literally the mm. question that she asked people when she meets them. And it's interesting if you do that and you, people will say, oh, well, you know what? I sell this or I do that or I'm looking for a job, whatever. But it opens that conversation. So I've gotten referrals from people that I have never done design work for. Mm. People have given my name and they said, you know what? I met this woman <laughs> and we were in line at <laughs> Target, <laughs> but she seemed but she seems so great. <laughs> and so, you know, I think it's important to, you know, I think sometimes, especially as designers, I've, I've spoken to colleges and, and students and I always say, you can be the best designer out there. And I'm not at all saying that I'm the best designer out there, but you, if you can't get a client and if you can't sell your idea or your vision, you, you're, you just, you're a non-working amazing designer, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, That's so a great like phrase I there, just... a non-working amazing designer. There is something in that. <laughs> I may have so to start quoting you on that, Andrea. <laughs> right? You like it? I'm sure that was all kind of broken that, you know, English, but it's the truth. I'm like, you know, know. what? I have no problem saying, you know what? Right now we're heavy on bathrooms, but... Um, I'm, I am looking for an amazing customer to give them a fabulous kitchen. Yeah. And then they'll say, Oh, you know what? My friend's house sucks. You know, I'm going to tell her <laughs> I met you. Like I have literally had people say that. <laughs> Oh my goodness. Okay. So here's the thing. I love, I'm going to run down some of the things you, you gave us a lot of ways that you create I know, I business rambled. in there. <laughs> Not at all, but it's like a lot of goodness in there. So I'm going to recap. So it's referrals. Okay. I'm going to ask you about that. It's networking. Okay, so that's professional organizations that you're networking with where you're attending as a member. Maybe it's the Chamber of Commerce. Maybe it's the PTA, whatever exactly. it is, right? Okay, speaking engagements to organizations. And I'm going to just infer, we're not talking about talking in front of your peers at High Point. We're talking about, again, the Chamber of Commerce, the PTA, the, the women's group, the, the junior league, all of these things, right? Right. Okay. Right. And right. then you're always selling even in line at Target. Okay. Love that. <laughs> and then yes. um, I love the opener line. What can I do to help you grow professionally? Because you're so right. If we say that to someone else, they're first probably going to think we're lunatics, right? Nobody ever asks me what mm -hmm. you can do for me. Right. But once they like, you know, sit back on it and they think, oh, 
what can you do? And then what's your next thought as a human person? It's what can I do for you? What do you do, right? So I love these um, very specific examples. My question is, I know the one that people are going to be thinking, our, de our designer friends listening, Andrea, reaching out to existing client base. What does that look like specifically? How do you do it? What do you say? What is that process in detail? So this is a blessing and a curse. I become friends pretty much with everyone, if you can, you can probably imagine. <laughs> and so my clients have, especially the clients that are amazing, wonderful clients, they are, they are like friends, they're friends slash family. Like they are wonderful. So a couple different things. Um, I always check in with my projects when they're completed. I usually do a follow-up about about 60 to 90 days afterwards, just giving them a chance to kind of get settled in. I bring over lunch or wine or, or just something and just, just chat, just get mm. to see how they're doing, see how they're enjoying the space. And then if it's them, I'll say, so are you ready now to work on phase two mm. or <laughs> phase, phase three, whatever. So that's one way. Um, the second way is if they're a client that maybe, you know, we did the full project, we, we finished their basement and they're good for the year, you know, I'll say, when are you having your next, you know, when are you going to have that gathering? I mean, it's COVID, so it's totally mm -hmm. not the same, but, yes. um, in the past it would be, you know, let's have a little, a little walkthrough of your kitchen, show them how amazing your space is now. And. I'll be there. I'll bring wine and then just, and I'll almost do a Q and a, and my clients love it because they get to be so proud of the work that was done. And also they'll invite like their closest friends, their neighbors, et cetera. And I'll say, you know, invite people that you think would be able to use our service in the future. And I'll bring coffee and, you know, maybe it's a little morning breakfast, whatever, but I try to do things to really personalize it and to let them kind of see the personality that I have. And it also makes the client really feel special and they're very, very proud. Um, so that's, that's a big way that I do it. And then once a year, I also circle back and just check in with my clients. I, you know, just how you doing? How's, how's the year been? How are you holding up? So it's really about relationship for me. Now, keep in mind, I have clients that I absolutely do not want referrals from. And, <laughs> and, I, and, I, and I still do the three month check in, um, but that's about it. <laughs> <laughs> That's really, really awesome. <laughs> it's a good thing you told us that too, right? <laughs> so, okay. So here's what I love about this. First of all, the, the, the two to three month check-in is like, it's forget that it's serving your purpose. It's excellent customer service. I mean, if you've just done a complete renovation for me or a construction project, I'm not thinking, why are you calling me three months later? I'm like, oh, she cares if all the things, the bells and whistles are all still working and, and the nails didn't pop and all the dumb stuff that happens, right? Right. Yeah. So I right. love that. That's an easy one. That's an easy one that I can really understand. Even the most introverted of us could put that as part of our process because it liter literally is just exactly. up leveling your, your, your client experience. Right now, the next one I think is a little exactly. trickier. Okay. And I think it's really cool, but it's trickier. So the next one where you have this, um, sort of Q and a walkthrough unveiling of the work that you've done for a client, it reminds me of when the realtors have open houses for each other. Right. So the house is going to have an open house for the Absolutely. public. Right. But the realtor is like, okay, all of my friends and all my realtor co colleagues come over I'll put bagels and coffee out and we'll all talk about the house and I'll tell you what's great about it so my question in there Andrea is do you when you onboard a client and you talk about what it's like to work with your your company do you tell them and at the end I want to let you know of a really special feature that I include of you know five or six months out you know blah 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 I would like to have you invite your friends to this thing and I would love to be there to blah 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 or do you hit them with it out of the blue maybe on that 60 90 day and you suggest it then how do you actually put that into the process 
Now that's a great question. Now it's definitely not for just, oh, we renovated your powder room. You know, okay. so this is this Perfect. is more this is more the, you know, we've put an addition on your house or okay. we've finished the basement and created this really amazing space or renovated your first floor. And I talked to them about it in the very beginning. So I discussed um, the process of, you know, taking pictures in the beginning, getting photography done at the end. And I, and I do point out, let me sidebar really quick. There are some projects that, you know, I'm like, you know, that just didn't turn because, you know, clients sometimes get a little too involved and it just didn't turn out the way I wanted. <laughs> so I will, you know, I'll share with some clients that we don't photograph all projects, you know, because sometimes I'm like, you know what, I might even want to take pictures of this because yeah. they made me so mad. <laughs> so, but, you know, those are things I just, I try to give them a big overview. And then I definitely say, you know, especially when it comes to like your kitchens and, and renovations of that magnitude, I say, you know, what is going to be the first event that you have in your new kitchen? Mm. You know, and they might say, oh, I've been thinking about that. I think it's going to be a birthday party or maybe it's going to be dinner or whatever. And I'll say, oh, my goodness, that's so great. And then that's when I will kind of tie in. I'll say, you know, with some of my clients and if you feel comfortable with this, you know, we can do a small little gathering for your close friends. Uh, maybe people in the neighborhood, because you know, everybody is, you know, I'm sure they want to know what you're doing, how it turned out. And then I can be there. And if they have questions, it's a perfect opportunity. And then I'll say, I'll say, and also, you know, usually my referrals come from clients. So this mm -hmm. is a great opportunity to show our work. And then usually they're excited because, you know, people like to show off what they've done. <laughs> okay, right, 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 right. I mean, you know, you can't, you know, if you're keeping up with the Joneses, you got to let them know. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> okay. So, all right. So the thing is, and I imagine that you are interjecting this concept, this idea, but as you said, there are some clients by the end of it that you have no desire to do this with. So you're not making it like <laughs> sign here. This is definitely going to happen. It's sort of like you tell about it. Maybe they remember, maybe they don't. But then when you go ahead and remind them at the 60 or 90 day that you'd like to do that, then it's like, oh yeah, I remember we talked about that. Is that, exactly. is, am I on the point with that? You're okay. Right on. Okay. Okay. So I'm also, you know, I, I, I try to be the, 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 the listener out there. Right. And so I know, even though myself and others probably heard that and thought I could do that. There's probably somebody still listening, Andrea, that's like, yeah, but isn't that weird? Like saying, oh, you're going to have your first thing where you're showing off your renovation here is going to be, you know, your kid's birthday party. And why are you inviting the designer to it? Like, that's weird for me to show up. So <laughs> is it really that you will say, oh, that first birthday party? Or it's like, would you like to do it a week or two before? And like, do you couch it in anything? Like, let's make sure everything, all the bells and whistles are flying and everything looks pretty. Like, how do you actually do that? Yeah, you know, you're exactly right. It's It probably is not going to be the, the kid's third birthday party. <laughs> but by the time these projects are over, I'm usually invited to this kid's third birthday party. <laughs> <laughs> and people will say, Oh, how do you know? I've never <laughs> met you before. And I'm like, oh, I'm the designer. And they're like, oh, okay. Wow, you're here. Um, so that has definitely happened. But I try to make it, you know, again, a little bit more of a casual event. I mean, I started in this industry of ours in 1999. And I was a kitchen designer working for a, a showroom in Bethesda. And I took this class and the class was about, it's funny you say customer service because it stuck with me. It was about how to have excellent customer service. And there were little, and they weren't talking about it from a kitchen design standpoint. It was just a customer service sales standpoint. And it was always talking about touch points. And I've, I've thought of that. I've kept that in mind throughout my years. And I even um, did a talk at ICFF a couple of years ago about the luxury client and the luxury client, which I'm sure all of us want and all of us desire, they expect exceptional love, exceptional customer service. Mm -hmm. Think about when you go to, you know, you're purchasing a car, think about the difference of, you know, I love going into Neiman's and it's a different experience than if you walk into, I'm not 
you know, another store. Yeah, Macy's, so right. It's, it, it, there we go. So I think about that. And so when you, and, and people that are at a luxury price point, luxury experience, they want to feel special. So I think when you approach it that way and say, you know, this will be a time for you to, you know, show your space, you know, you make it about them. And at the same time, it's about you, but right. it still is about them. Yeah, it's it's a really it's a it's a brilliant strategy. And it does take in order to be the designer that is invited to the kids birthday parties. It does take all of those what you described as the touch points throughout that process. You can't just show up at the end and say we're besties, right? Like you have right. to deliver meaningful um, contribution to that relationship throughout it, right? Right, right. And again, it can be double edged because there can be times when, you know, I have had situations where I'm like, oh my gosh, they're crazy. <laughs> <laughs> no, you have? <laughs> yeah. And then you're like, I don't want to be their best friend when this is over. Like, when this is over, I want it's this over. to be over. <laughs> Oh you know, my goodness. Yeah, so, I know, right? So there's definitely that that dance of <laughs> one of my good friends, she was like, Girl, some of your clients. I'm like, I know. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness that's so good and it's so true you know it is it's a dance it's it's walking that line right and really figuring right. out the people whose values that align with yours and that they're you know just the, a culture fit right like just you as right. a, one human to another human do you think like alike talk alike all the things right right, right. exactly <laughs> yeah no I, I think <sighs> it's very good so all right so um and I just also do want to touch on you know, it's interesting because so many of us say we want these X things in the coming year in our business. And then we literally make the list and we just like, okay, universe, deliver, right? right. And, you know, I also know that not only in the history of the five and a half years of the podcast at this point and also just wow. my own business, right? I know that these things that you mentioned – are literally the basics, the tenants on how you build your client base. Referrals, networking, speaking engagements, always selling, reaching out to your existing client base, asking mm -hmm. for what you want. But I think what happens is we tend to gloss over and say, oh, well, ne I don't know, networking, does it really work? And speaking engagements, do they really work? And, and we know, you know, and I know that they do work, right? And so right. if your personality isn't one that you are going to get up and do a speaking engagement, then maybe at least you go to the engagements in your community, right? Exactly. Yeah, exactly. And it, and it doesn't have to be, you know, the big events. I, that's why I point out it can right. be small things that you're comfortable in. You know, if you have kids, I, my daughter plays lacrosse and, I've gotten referrals from other lacrosse parents. Now keep in mind, again, that's that delicate subject. I got one referral and I went to their house and I had never met the husband before. Hopefully she's not listening. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I was like, yeah, I'm not going to do this. And I just said to her, you know, I really were lacrosse parents. I would just like to keep it professional. Um, but then I have another lacrosse parent that I'm doing their whole house and I just, you know, but she yeah. doesn't want people to know either. And I was like, that's fine with me. <laughs> right, 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 right. Yeah. So well, it's, it's, it's understanding that there are, I was going to say there aren't bad people, but of course there are bad people, but it's, right. it's 99 percent when we don't gel with a client. It's not that they're bad and we're good. We're just different. Right. We're just different. Right. And our styles are different. And I don't mean our aesthetics. I mean, our communication style, our values, whatever, you know, the way we function in a business transaction. And so it doesn't have to be that somebody you don't like them or they're not a good person. It's just you have to have the radar up for will the professional relationship relationship be productive, right? Exactly. Yeah. And yeah. that's, and there's nothing wrong with that. Right. Uh, my friend who's an attorney, she actually gave me a, she's like, it's like dating. You're going to meet people and they're nice, but they're just not for you. Right. And so there are clients that just aren't a good fit. And I'm working on that even, even now after, 
you know, doing this for 20 years, there are times that if it's a referral, I have, I have felt a little guilty because I'm like, oh, they gave me a referral. Like it could really be a great project, but it's not my client. And I think it's important to understand who your client is. And that's not a financial, that's not a, pro that is a, you know, there are people that, you know, maybe they're going to want to micromanage you. Mm -hmm. And, and that's not their job to micromanage you doing your job. And if that's not going to work for you, you have to be honest with yourself about that. And I have definitely, I, I'm in that situation right now where I'm like, oh my gosh, if I would have known and really understood their, their style, as far as a client, I would not have taken this project mm -hmm. on. Mm -hmm. So it's really important to be honest with yourself about mm -hmm. what, and, and that can fluctuate. Maybe there's a time or a season that you're okay with that type of client, but maybe when you're, you know, when you're busy, you're booked, you have a lot of stuff going on, you don't need that client. So it just, it's okay to have those, again, pivot points where you have to say, you know what, we're not going to focus on this right now. We're going to do something else. Exactly. Exactly right. It's like, you know, it's like your your best friend introduces you to somebody that she thinks you'd be a great match for to date. And you don't click, but you'll turn around and introduce your next girlfriend to the same guy, right? There's exactly. nothing wrong with the guy. He's just not exactly. your guy. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. exactly. Okay, exactly. good. All right. And then again, just I, I know I'm hammering it because I know what I hear when I talk with designers one-on-one -on -one is – the thing that I love that you stressed is that the gatherings don't have to be big. It could be a small PTA thing, a small club thing, a dinner with the parents of your kids, you know, choir practice, whatever it is. Because for the type of product and services that we offer, if there's only 10 people in the room and one hires you, that, exactly. that that number is great. We don't need right. 500 people in the room because we can't necessarily take on 20 new projects at one time. So Exactly, exactly. Right, right. so making the, to your way of, of selling and to building your business is creating an, um, relationships. And the truth is the smaller the situation, the more likely you are to um, develop a, a meaningful relationship. So I love this. Right. Okay. Okay. All right. And then, um, so, so what happens now is, so we know that it takes a while. So you might be doing your networking, you might be doing your speaking, you might be, you know, bumping and meeting into the people at the target and it gets to be, <laughs> you know, it's April and we don't have two new projects. Okay. We we're supposed to have a new project for February, March, and April. We sh we don't have three. Have mm -hmm. you found, I have found in my business, I'm curious if you found it in your own that, if we don't throw the baby out with the bathwater there and we keep plugging along, now maybe May we get five projects. Like we have to have faith, right? That our, our tactics are working. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. Okay. Tell us a little bit about that. Oh my gosh. I, um, it was 2019 and it was September and I usually have like a big summer project and it was, August and I didn't have a big summer project. And then September came and I started panicking because again, I'm looking at, you know, my goal and I'm like, oh my gosh, you know, I know that if you don't have contracts signed by end of September, you know, pretty much that's your year, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I was trying not to panic and I was like, okay, let's just, you know, kind of reassess. And I was at my friend's husband's birthday party and this woman who literally, I don't know, she was like, oh my God, I love your sweater. And I was like, oh, thanks. I got it in Korea, blah, 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 blah. And we talked about what I did and she was telling me about what she did. And she was like, oh, well, let me get some of your cards. I was like, great. I am not joking. The next week I got four referrals from her and three Whoa. contracts signed Whoa. all like, they, one of the women didn't, like, I, she was ready to write me a check at that point. I hadn't even put a presentation <laughs> together. She was like, you know, Audra, Audra is amazing. So I know you're amazing. And I'm saying to myself, I don't even know Audra, but okay. <laughs> and love Audra. Became, oh my God. Love Audra. <laughs> and she actually became one of, she's a pretty um, influential person in 
not only the area, but in the U.S. And she has been an amazing client. And she was a fantastic start to 2020. And we finished her project during COVID, but we did her entire, every room in her house except for one. Wow. So yeah. I'm now like, you, thank you, Audra. Yeah. And you got to work <laughs> your system. That's the takeaway, right? You got to work your system. Right. Keep doing it. Have faith. It doesn't, you know, sometimes it happens quick. Sometimes it happens slow, but it doesn't happen if you don't do it. That's the, that's the lesson, right? Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And to be open to it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Love it. So tell me about this brick and mortar. Now, it's so funny because so many designers now are not only have closed up the brick and mortars that they had um, because during the pandemic, closed them up that they had. Uh, but you went and, you know, you had a goal. You wanted it before COVID hit and you went through with it despite COVID. Tell us a little bit about why did you want the brick and mortar? How does it function in your business? What was it like? What's the the, you know, reality of having it. Yeah. Isn't that funny? I <laughs> like people were breaking leases and I'm like, I'm still <laughs> going to do this. I don't know if it was the smartest, <laughs> but it's been amazing. So, um, I, look, I had a dream. So years, I mean, many years ago, I said, you know, one day I wanted to have a studio space and the way I saw it so many years ago was that it was going to be this kind of collaborative design cohesive like I would have you know other designers and mm. it was like it was almost like a we work before there was we work wow I, I wish I would have done it then because I didn't but that was in my head because I always thought about how you know as designers we work from home and we sometimes you know you go to your you know you're at the design center or you're at you know Ferguson plumbing stores different things and you see each other you might nod your head but you don't really you know, if, unless you have a, a big, a real connection, you don't have that kind of interaction and engagement. And so my idea was like, you know, to have this space where, you know, people could work, you can come in and you could brainstorm together and you could bounce off ideas and you could support each other. And, um, you know, so that was a goal probably over the last 10 years. And then life happens. Um, I got divorced uh, in 2012 or so. Um, you know, raising a daughter, single parent, et cetera. Then I got remarried in 2017, 18. And then I'm getting divorced again. <laughs> I swear I don't suck, but. <laughs> but oh my, I don't know that I've ever laughed when somebody told me they were getting divorced, but you're like, I'm getting divorced again. I swear I don't suck. <laughs> As I'm holding back the tears. No. <laughs> So at my 10 year, it was, again, I'm kind of that goal oriented. So I was like, you know what? 10 years would be a great time to say, let's, let's, let's focus on this studio again. So I started looking at spaces in 2019, you know, never found quite the right one, kept looking, kept looking. And then 2020 came in and I was like, it's happening this year. And my goal was to have it happen in Q1 and, you know, and then of course, February comes and then March and it's a pandemic. And then I'm sitting here and my mentor. So I do believe that everyone should have a professional mentor. So my business mentor, she's not even in my field. She said, are you still trying to do that studio thing? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, uh, actually, yes. And she said, okay. <laughs> okay. And crazy as this crazy so, does. It's, it's crazy as crazy <laughs> does. And so I changed my approach. I was like, you know what? I'm going to circle back now to, cause I was looking at places and the, it was just expensive and they weren't exactly what I wanted. And I was like, you know what, I'm going to expand my reach and mm. maybe think differently and think about other spaces. And I was reaching out to people and all of a sudden they were like, Oh yeah, you want to sign a lease in a pandemic? Really? <laughs> sure. <laughs> Meet me here. This, this space is now empty. This That's place, it. this person's moving out. And, um, walked into this space and it all worked out because I was actually looking in Baltimore. I'm in um, Howard County, Maryland. And I was thinking Baltimore, I was like, you know, I wanted to bring design to an area that they don't necessarily see that. Mm. Um, and, and it's closer. I was like, I can get there in 20 minutes versus an hour getting to DC. Mm. But, um, I live in an area, it's Ellicott city and they had actually just aired. And I don't know if you watch Gordon Ramsay, but he has like the, the, um, from hell and back. Oh, right. But he, 
but he had aired a special on Ellicott City because we were actually hit with two 1,000 year floods Whoa. in two years. And so the community has been destroyed. The community has been really suffering. It's a historic area. It's Mm -hmm. built on part of the um, B&O Canal and um, Patapsco River. And so there's been terrible flooding, a lot of businesses lost, families, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And I love the area. I've always loved that kind of historic charm. And I started reaching out to some realtors and They were like, you know, I went to go look at a space in Main Street and it wasn't quite right. But the guy was like, you know what, can I show you a space that, you know, is available? And I walked in and it was twice as large as I expected and wanted. And I was like, oh, my gosh. And of course, in my head, I'm going, "Okay, this is double the size, which means it's going to be double my Mm -hmm. budget. Mm -hmm. And so I said to him, I said, look, you know, this is a wild card. It is a pandemic. I don't know how much you're thinking, but obviously my budget is this. So if you can make this happen, let me know. And I said, but I'm ready to, you know, move forward if you are. And he was like, well, why don't you look around and and I'll get back to you. So he let me look around and I didn't even want to look. I mean, it was like exposed brick. I feel beams. I was like, oh my gosh, it's perfect. (laughs) I don't want to love it. I don't want to love it. (laughs) I don't want to love it. I don't want to love it. And I live... 10 minutes away. Whoa. By the time I got home, I had an email from him and he was like, when do you want to, when do you want to start the lease? That's it. That's and it. You I gotta was ask. like, oh, yeah. okay. <laughs> it goes back to what you said earlier. You have to ask for what you want, right? Ask for what you want. And it has been wonderful. Um, just the, the support of the community I expressed earlier, you know, it's a, it's a historic area, but it's not a, not a diverse area. So we are the first black owned brick and mortar on the, on the street. And overall, we've gotten really great support. We've gotten referrals from other businesses, which has been wonderful. And even though the pandemic has happened, I have still tried to really stick with the goals that I had with the business. So I've hosted two pop-up events by appointment for other entrepreneurs that in general would have done these type of things in their home. Mm. Um, I have hosted a networking event again, 10 people, you know, you had to have a negative COVID vaccine. I mean, shot, um, Mm. you know what I'm trying to say. Yes. You had to have Um, your vaccine. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. And, um, and, or a negative COVID test. test. Yes. Yeah. My goal, my goal was definitely to support other entrepreneurs and it's really been great. And so I'm just hoping that as things continue and the world continues to, you know, try to open up in the new normal that we'll be able to, we'll be able to do this. So it's, um, it's been great. Like I said, I, I, I signed a very long lease <laughs> so, <laughs> so because you don't, like, suck. <laughs> I don't suck. <laughs> so I'm like, you know, when this, when the lease is over in a, We'll see what happens next, but mm-hmm. so far, so Exciting. far, so good. Exciting. I'm happy for you. I'm really happy for you. It sounds like a great space. I mean, it sounds like all the things, you know what it is? It's having a little faith, right? Keep going. Keep looking. Uh, like you said, the, the key was you expanded. When you said, I expanded my reach, like where else could I look? What else could be happening? And were, and was open to a different thought than maybe the original thought that you had when you set the goal at the beginning of the year, right? It's like right. to your whole um, you know, message to me was being flexible and being willing to pivot, but to stay on track with your goals. So we keep the goal, but we throw away some of the things that we thought were attached to that goal and open our mind to what other way could we get to this goal, right? Right. I love it. And tell me about that experience, being the first Black-owned business in that neighborhood. You said that it's been positive. Has, you know, what has it really been like? Was it, did you, did you, did you, Think about it going in. In other words, this is the this is what I've learned when in this last you I'm embarrassed to say it's in the last year that I've learned it. I should have learned it, you know, a hundred years ago when I was born, right? But this is what I've learned in the last year that having um, a, a systemic, you know, having white being white and the privilege. That's the word I was looking for is privilege. Having white privilege, I've never rented a space 
any place in our entire business career where I've even considered, was I the only one? Was there, was there more white people? Was there, what was the mix up of the um, demographic? It's just like, I want to rent this space. I'm here. Right. And so that's a that's a that's an aha when I speak with business owners like yourself in the last year. So tell us about that. Was it something you thought of? Or was it like when you moved in and you noticed it? You know, it's something that you always think about. It's it's funny. My um, my first husband was Italian American, Mm -hmm. Italian Irish to be exact. And I remember that we went to this event. And he was so bothered because there were there were maybe two other white people. And he was like, oh, my gosh, I can't believe, you know, like I'm like one of two. And I just kind of chuckled and I said, Do you realize that I'm always yeah. the only one. Yeah. And I think it's even a little bit more in, in this field. I mean, I remember walking into events and being one of one of few. So that is kind of a norm. And it's and I actually I love that right now in the climate that we have, regardless of what what pushed it, I do feel like designers of color, and that could be any color, um, are getting more opportunities mm-hmm. to be present and to be seen because I think it's important because we, you know, we do exist, we're out there. But when I <laughs> When I, when I picked this space, I was prepared. Mm. I was prepared for there to be challenges. I was hoping that they weren't going to be, you know, like 1950 type challenges. Right. But I knew that there would probably be some people that weren't going to be happy with me being in the neighborhood. And of course there were, but the ones that, I mean, there are some amazing people that immediately were like, we're going to do a virtual grand opening and a ribbon cutting. Like we want everyone to know you're here Mm. and we got flowers and they've been super supportive and the management company, they're amazing. And it, you know, I just say focus on the light and the love versus the negative. And so there are, people on main street that I adore and they have just been completely warm and inviting and welcoming. And the ones that don't, I'm like, I, you know, you're missing out. Mm -hmm. Yes. 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 But it takes a a certain amount of um, courage to adopt that thought process. Right. And probably resilience. We mentioned that word earlier before, um, to, to be able to ignore the hurt and the judgment and all the other, whatever it is that they're doing, that you're getting that sense that, hmm, rather you weren't here, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. And I think the big lesson for, um, you know, myself and others, other white people that have lived in their white privilege for their entire lives is to have that, like what you just said, it's something I always think about. It's something when I'm going to rent this or I'm going to do this, I always, it's always on my mind. Am I going to be the, the only black person? And if I am, am I going to be treated well and all the things? I mean, that's sort of what the message is, right? Right. And that's the thing. And it's not a, I want to, I want to clarify because it's not a, a walking in with a chip on your shoulder type of thing, because I think that sometimes people have that Mm -hmm. attitude as well. Mm -hmm. I think it's more of just being, it's the reality. Like, You know, I'm sure that, and and I appreciate you saying privilege because it's, you know, racial conversations are always challenging because you don't want to offend anyone and you, and I feel like sometimes it's hard to have those difficult conversations, but I think they're important, but I think it's one of those, it's the acknowledgement that this is real, you know, so things happen in our society and people are like, oh, I have friends that they'll like, they were texting me. They're like, oh my gosh, I can't believe that this is happening in, in 2020. Yeah. I can't believe this is happening. And I'm like, really? Yeah. You can't believe it? <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and then they're like, well, what do you mean? Mm-hmm. And then so it's, but that is where the dialogue comes in. And then it's like, okay, so yeah, this, this is, this happens. Like I've been pulled over racially profiled. Like, and it's funny. Cause I tell people I'm probably one of the least like quote unquote aggressive and I've been called aggressive Mm. and you know just little things like that and so exactly Mm -hmm. so 
again, it's just the understanding that if something happens, you're not surprised. And right. I think that's more of what it is. It's the, you know, I'm prepared and I'm not surprised. I don't want things to happen. Do I still get, do I get bothered if they do? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, but if it does happen, it doesn't shake me to my core where I'm like, oh my God, I right. can't believe they did that. Well, it's just like, and it okay. probably comes from a well, lifetime of it happening to you and developing that resilience to it and processing it and understanding that the flaw is on the part of the person who's behaving that way and the flaw is not yours to own, right? Right, right, exactly. Right, right, right. Exactly. That, yeah, yeah. You know, it's it's an interesting thing because I, I agree with you that having the conversation is the important part and it's the conversation um, white to white and white to black and white to people of color and all the things. And to that point, um, recently at Easter, my family was together and we were having a conversation about it and about what's going on and about our awarenesses and our, um, you know, different layers of awakenings. Like you just said, like your friends are like, really, you know, like, you know, this happens in 2020 and you're like, yeah. Right. So we were having yeah. this conversation and what was interesting was, is my cousin grown man, um, mm -hmm. he, he said to us when, when, when we, someone at the table was saying, I don't know. I mean, is it really happening now? Like what's, what's going on? Right. And he said, well, I'll give you a perfect example. He said, I have a team that I manage, you know, and I don't know if he manages 30 people or whatever it is. And he said, and obviously I have uh, men and women on my team that are black. And he said, whenever potential client or a client will push through and insist to speak to me on a point that they either want us to do for them. We're not going to do for them. He's in mortgage banking, right? Blah, blah, blah. He okay. said, whenever I see that, he goes, I know to a time it's because the person who presented the final no to them on something was one of my mm. black team members. In other words, a white person will it will tend to say well that might not be true because this person told it to me i have to get pushed through to the boss i mean he's noticed that in his team and of course he always he said i have my team members back he said you know they are completely qualified otherwise they wouldn't be on my right. team you know what i mean like right. yes what they right. said is real you know what i mean it's true you right. can't have this mortgage or you do have to provide this document or whatever it is and it was funny because everyone at the table now i've been having these conversations for the last year and everyone at the table went whoa right wow crazy yeah crazy. And so we wouldn't have had that conversation if last year did not get to the absurdity that it did. And really the movement start to really, um, you know, cross over into the white people who are interested in at least trying to deconstruct and understand it. Right. So, right. Interesting, interesting, wow. interesting. So, but I'm, I, 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 and I also hear you with, you're not saying that when you notice it and you're aware of it and you're thinking about it, that you're not coming in with the chip on your shoulder. You're not like, I'm here. It's just, it's, it's exactly. a fact of your life that, that we as white people have not really probably encountered more than if ever more than a few times whereas for what you're describing is it's something that's part of everything that you do is that thought process is this going to be kosher is this going to be fine am I going to have a problem is everybody going to be playing nicey nicey in the sandbox right right is that's exactly it that is exactly it it's there is just an understanding that you, you know, that white people, I, you know, and again, it doesn't even have to be a white person, but just there's an understanding that things could be handled differently, treated differently because you're a person of color. Right. Right, 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 right. Okay, well, one by one, we're trying to make a difference in that. <laughs> so, and I love, and I love that. And the thing, I love that because, again, I feel that having the dialogue is a big step. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, that, and that's, what, that's all that we can do, mm -hmm. you know, just to continue to have 
big steps moving forward. Mm -hmm. Yes. To me, when you say it's all we can do, the two things that we can do are to have the dialogue and then to reflect on your part in the lesson that you learned from that. Like, like, you know what I mean? The lesson that you learn in the dialogue. It's like, where do I show up in that? How, what have I done that has contributed to that in the past? Am I making changes going forward in my thinking, in my presentation, in my practices? Um, you know, both for insider industry and just for humanity. I mean, that's, that's where I'm processing all of this. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, I have to tell you, you are a firecracker. <laughs> you are a heck of a smart lady. <laughs> and you know what, Andrew? You do not suck. Okay. So. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you so much. This, is, this oh. has been absolutely awesome. I am, um, like I said, I love opportunities to just connect and and let it, you know, let people know we're here. So I, I, I describe myself. I think I even told Andrew this when we connected. I never had thought about PR. It's funny when I even say it out loud. It feels a little assuming. I'm like, oh, my PR person. I'm like, oh my god, it sounded <laughs> terrible. But it's like I, I describe myself as. Have you ever watched a movie and? there's a supporting cast or there's an actress mm. or actor and you know who they are. You've seen them in other, other movies, but if somebody says, what's their name, right? You can't, you have no idea what their name is. <laughs> Not with like, a gun to your head. I, you couldn't come up with it. Right. You're like, I don't know. You're like, Oh my God, what is their name? And then you're like, Oh my God, they were in this and they were in this and you can name the movies they were in. You, you know, you've seen them, they've been around for years, but you cannot think of who they are to save your life. And then you go on, what is it like the I, what is the IDB or whatever. Right, right, right. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Listing. Yes. And then you're like, that's their name? That's how (laughs) I That doesn't even ring a bell. That's who I am. Right. That's who I am in the design world. I've been doing this since 1999. I've been at trade shows. I've been, and people always say, oh my God, I know you. And I'm like, yeah, I'm, you know. Yeah. Yeah. So. <laughs> well, and you know what? So, and even in your own community, it's it, it marks exactly. the same point. It's you're there, you're doing business, and maybe now with the brick and mortar, you know, it will be like, oh, that really nice lady in that tour, that store around the corner. But we need them exactly. to say Andrea Harvey. Like we need them exactly. to have the name, right? <laughs> right. Yeah, because especially exactly. without the brick and mortar, then it's like, I met this great lady. She's a great designer. She's a great personality. All the, I can't remember. Her name. Let me see if I can call my friend to get it for you. At least now the store, they can point them to the store. But, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Love it. So that's it. So I am just, I'm excited that I've been a working designer for all these years, um, but definitely love the opportunity to be able to talk to amazing women, professionals like you and uh, be able to, to help whoever we can. Yeah, well, you did a great job in doing that today, helping us understand some really great ideas for growing our business into managing, you know, change and, you know, struggle and all the things. So thanks so much, Andrea. I appreciate it. It was a great conversation. Oh, absolutely. Thank you. Andrea is, I mean, she's just amazing, isn't she? We decided as soon as we were off air, we have to meet in person one day and hopefully very soon. She's spunky and fun and outgoing. And most importantly, though, she's full of knowledge and experience and honesty. And I love all of these traits. I'm so impressed that in a time when many are turning away from brick and mortar studios altogether, Andrea was determined to stick to her goal, even if she had to walk a slightly longer path to get there. It's clear that Andrea is a goal getter and a goal setter, which I respect tremendously. I love her process of setting the big vision ideas, then breaking those down into quarterly, monthly, and weekly goals. That makes it so much easier to avoid the pattern that so many of us fall into of setting big goals that feel unattainable and then we never take action on, right? Smaller, weekly goals feel doable. And when they're aligned to the big picture, we're able to continue to make progress. So, but what do you do when something shakes up your goals? What do you do when the unexpected happens? That's where Andrea's balance of flexibility and structure comes into play. Look, she puts forth the structured effort, working with her team every month on goal setting and what's coming up next. But when the unexpected happens, she's not thrown off course. She adjusts so that she can thrive. 
That's impressive. It's about sticking to those goals, but understanding that some of the things you thought were necessary, some of the things you thought you had to do, or some of the things that you had to accompany to reach the goal, maybe they weren't so important after all. So you toss those things out and you open your mind to another way to reach the goal. It's exactly what Andrea did with opening her studio. It didn't happen right when she wanted it to, and it didn't happen the way she initially envisioned, but she was fine with it. She was flexible, and she gave herself permission to adjust her goal and retackle it when the time was right. And because of that approach, she was actually op- able to open the brick and mortar studio in this crazy time. I also want to talk about Andrea's ability to generate strong referrals, right? Clearly, Andrea is an extrovert. She makes friends with her clients, with random people at Target, (laughs) with everyone she talks to, with me right away, right? This is a huge benefit. I know that, right? She's in constant networking mode, and it's brilliant. One little nuance that Andrea talked about was the idea that she heard from one of her coaches. It was to ask others, how can I help you grow professionally? That's a great way to open conversations and a great way to build relationships. And it doesn't just work for extroverts. If you remember Judith Taylor's episode about networking for introverts, she had a similar idea. When Judith approaches people at events, she says, what can I do to help your business grow? right? When you hear something like that, you feel like the other person has your best interest at heart. This is how you build strong networks. This is how you get that referral train going. That's how you get people to evangelize you and spread your name, right? And I also want to point out what Andrea is doing here is more than just being friendly. She is playing to her strengths, bringing that warmth and friendliness to the client experience, but she's doing it strategically. The three-month follow-up that she has with her clients is beautiful, right? She gives her clients a chance to live in the space. Then she shows up with wine or lunch and talks it through with them, proving to the client that she she truly does care about their happiness with the space, right? Then taking it a step further by coming to the events that her clients have showing off the space. She mingles with the guests, answers questions, and of course, she's networking the entire time. It's a win-win because she's creating this great customer experience and in return is getting direct access to her next potential clients. Love it, (laughs) right? And I have to say, I also genuinely appreciated Andrea's honesty about not necessarily wanting to do that with every client, right? Look, sometimes things happen and we're not proud of the work. Maybe the client pushed for changes that you as the designer didn't feel that great about. Maybe budget issues got in the way. Sometimes we have those clients who we don't want to work with again and the projects that we're not thrilled with, it happens. It does. And it, it reminds me of Blanche Garcia in episode 282, And she talked about how you have to train the client to treat you the way you want to be treated. And I also cannot forget Blanche during Luann Live this year, (laughs) that amazing moment when she said, sometimes when a client who's not so fabulous, I just look at them and I think to myself, I don't want your bad juju in my portfolio. (laughs) When she said that, we all went to the floor, right? At some point in business, we have to get comfortable with not putting every project in the portfolio, right? Not saying yes to everyone and not settling for less than what you're worth, both in rates and in the way you are treated. The experience should be good for you too. And if it's not, then try not to put yourself back in that same position again. Learn from it, right? And finally, I do want to thank Andrea sincerely for sharing her experience in opening the first Black-owned brick-and-mortar design studio in her neighborhood. It must have taken a lot of courage and dedication to her vision and mission to do that. Andrea pointed out to us that when you are a Black business owner, this is always on your mind. It's something that you think about in every interaction, in every step of business. It's something that we as white people take for granted. This is the very essence of white privilege. This is also why, as white colleagues, we must be advocates for our black friends and colleagues. We don't have to think about this, but we should 
think about being part of the change so that one day our friends will not have to think about this either. I always appreciate when our Black designer colleagues are willing to share their experiences because it opens our eyes each time a little bit more every single time, even though it's not their responsibility to do the labor for us or tell us what to do or how to do it. But I still do genuinely appreciate hearing and understanding exactly how it feels so that it makes me think and reflect. I hope it does the same for you. I hope that you learned something valuable today about client experiences, about adjusting your goals, and keeping yourself on track even when things get shaken up. Look, things aren't always going to go really well in business. It's just not a realistic expectation, right? But you can tap into this idea of structured planning and letting in enough flexibility to adapt. Then that's how you can rise above anything that does come your way. Thanks ton so much for showing up today and listening to this episode. Decide to be excellent. Thank you so much for joining me again today. This podcast is a production of Window Works, your resource for custom window treatments and awnings. To learn how we can help you on your next interior design project, go to www.windowworks-nj.com. And if you're interested in working with me on your business, either through masterminds or one-on-one coaching, or you want to know how to get my book, The Making of a Well-Designed Business, or you just want to know what's going on in the podcast land, and where I'm going to be. All of that is found at luannnigara.com. Thank you so much. Have an excellent day.